Open up to Psalm 95. May I remind you, these are not the words of men about God. These are God's words to men. Psalm 95. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. For the Lord is the great God and the great King above all gods. In his hand are the deep places of the earth. The heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture, the sheep of His hand. If you want to turn to the New Testament, John chapter 4, that's the Gospel of John chapter 4. Jesus had some things to say about worship, big surprise. I say that kidding, of course. It's not a big surprise. John chapter 4 I know we're beginning sort of in the middle of a whole chapter here, but I just want to get to this part. Verse 23, these are the words of Jesus Christ himself, but the hour is coming and now is, listen to this, when the true worshipers, which indicates that there are what? False worshipers. He's distinguishing between the two. The hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and and truth. Why? For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is looking for worshipers. Verse 24, God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. One last verse in Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 15. Therefore, because of everything that's been said previously in the book, therefore by him, that is the Lord, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God, that is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. I'm doing something a little bit different because normally we just preach right through books, but a few times here and there we have reason for topicals, and I interrupt a series a couple, three times a year to talk about the ordinary means of grace. And we've talked about several of them, and this morning we want to give attention to yet another of what we call the ordinary means of grace, and that is in worship. Cal Ripken or Barry Bonds? Hands. How many of you know what I'm talking about? There you go. Baseball. Cal Ripken Jr. became an extraordinary baseball player by doing an ordinary thing. He showed up for work. Yeah. He played 2,632 consecutive games. Cal is in the Major League Baseball Hall of Fame really for consistently doing an ordinary thing, playing baseball every time they said, play ball. Barry Bonds. Barry Bonds was one of the most feared sluggers of the 1990s and early 2000s. Bonds broke Hank Aaron's all-time home run mark of 755 home runs. Bonds got 762 But Bonds' record is shrouded in controversy. Bonds did it by using illegal performance-enhancing drugs. Now, I don't care where you stand on this, you baseball fans. But because Bonds broke the record using extraordinary means, though he retired in 2007, which for some people may seem like a millennium ago, He has yet to be inducted into the Hall of Fame, and many people who write about it every time they're electing, nominating and electing, well, will anybody, will he get enough votes? 
Will he get enough votes? So far, no. Now, I know what you're all thinking. What does this have to do with worship? Worship can be done the ordinary way, the biblical way, or by use of extraordinary, extra-biblical means. Worship-enhancing innovations. What are, the ordinary, what are ordinary means of grace? Now, you don't need to write all this down. I was going to put it in the bulletin, but there's enough writing there already. What are ordinary means of grace? This is nothing new. We say this every time we talk about yet another of the ordinary means of grace. Ordinary means of grace are not the means by which we're saved. They're not the means by which we're saved. We, don't, we are not saved because we practice the ordinary means of grace. They're not the means by which we're saved, but they are the means. That means the methods and the practices by which those who are saved, how? By God's grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, for the glory of God alone. It is through these means that God's people grow in grace. But we call that sanctification. They're means by which we grow in grace, but means by which we mature in the faith. What are ordinary means of grace? They are ordinary rather than extraordinary. In that, that they are prescribed by God rather than invented by people. Worship enhancing drugs or innovations. The ordinary means of grace are simple rather than complex. They are simple rather than complicated. They are God-ordained rather than initiated by people. When earnestly observed, which means when we follow them, when we practice these ordinary means of grace, and we've talked about others in the past, today the focus is on worship, but it's true of all the ordinary means of grace. When earnestly observed, God will grow his people. We will be sanctified. He promises to complete the work he's begun in us. Do you believe that? And how does he promise to do that? By osmosis, when you put your head on the pillow, sanctification comes up from your posturpedic mattress and somehow you become more like Christ? No. It's through the ordinary means of grace. It's the ordinary means of grace. And not only will he grow his people <clears throat> spiritually, this is how he builds his church. And let us not forget that the church does belong to Jesus, according to Jesus, Matthew 16, 18, 18, 16. Why do I get sixes and eights mixed up? Public school. <laughs> Kidding. Age, thank you. Ushers, get that guy out of here. <laughs> he said it's his church. He said he will build it. And he said the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. In other words, his kingdom cannot fail. Do you believe that? But that's if we do what he says. That's if we employ the ordinary means of grace. What, why ordinary means of grace, particularly in worship? Of these, I think there is something for you to write down on your outlines there. Number one, God's ordinary means of grace are timeless rather than trendy. They're timeless rather than trendy. You know what takes place, and, and forgive me when it's, if it seems like this is just like making attacks at other people, because it, it is. But, you know, if you go to a church that is on the cutting edge, listen, unless they change what they're doing, they won't be for very long. If you marry the culture, you will be widowed very shortly. They're timeless rather than trendy, meaning these are things that people in the first century and people in the 17th century and people here in the 21st century they're common to all of us. God's ordinary means of grace, number two, may be observed by any people in any church and in any culture. Now, obviously, there's some differences in cultures, but the ordinary means of grace, the, the simplicity of what we do when we worship God, it should be consistent. It should be consistent. Any people, any church, not limited to those with big music budgets not restricted away from people who don't have the, the sort of exterior means to do what the big churches do. 
Thirdly, God's ordinary means of grace do not depend on special talent or technology. It's not about how great the worship leader is, and it's not about the fog machines or the laser lights. It's not about how big and loud the speakers are. Number four, God's ordinary means of grace point us to Christ and promote faith in Him rather than in anyone or, I might add, anything else. You know, I say that because it takes faith to do what God says when the rest of the world, and even in the church, there are many running after the newest innovations. If we believe the church is founded by Christ, if we believe the church belongs to Christ, if we believe the church is being built by Christ, and that, that Christ guarantees the church's success, then we must believe that he will build his church. Not on the basis of our new ideas from the world. And by the way, has anybody noticed when the church chases the world, we do a second-rate job of it, why is it, oh, you really like this new Christian band? They sound just like some singers who hate Christ. Well, gee, that's something. You know, aim a little higher. Why do we want to just chase the world? We don't want to do that. We need to believe that Christ will build his church based on his ideas, not our new ideas, usually from the world, but rather things that come from him, from his word. That's why we say, we will worship the Lord according to his word. Do we do it perfectly? No, we don't do it perfectly, because we're not perfect. But that is our goal. We're not looking for anything new. We're looking for Christ, and we're looking for him in his word, in the ways that are timeless rather than trendy. So we need to believe him enough to do church his way, so let's believe him and trust him. Just one footnote on that, and it's important to say this. This doesn't mean that every detail of every worship service everywhere in the world, even of those who are faithful to be trying to practice the ordinary means of grace, is going to be identical. There's, there are variations, and that's okay. There are variations, but never deviations from the basics, from the standards. We have to be very careful because many things are presented as being, oh, well, this is, we're still doing, no, it, you've left the stadium. We say this from time to time, and this is one of those times to say it again, worship, whose idea is it anyway? If you're looking at notes, hey, the answer is God's, not ours. He's God and we're not, amen? He created us to worship Him. That's what we are created for. And He alone, therefore, is in the position to say how worship is to be done. We got, I get an endless junk in my email inbox inviting us to go to every ridiculous conference that anybody can think up. There's a new one that came out. In fact, I forwarded it to the, uh, the main song, you know, main music director here. I'm married to her. And I said, hey, we should go to this. The title of the conference just had one word, innovation. And then you read what it says, learn new ways to worship God, things that no one's ever done before. A pox on your house. What does God say about how to worship? Not let us kind of think of something new. We don't need new. We need God and we need his, his word. It's his idea. It's his idea. In fact, when new, di uh, new ideas are introduced, what generally takes place is that worship descends and it eventually can become unacceptable. Remember what Jesus said. True worship looks like this. Why would he say that? If all worship is equally acceptable, he would have said worship looks like this. But he says, no, true worship is like this because, well, sadly, there's lots of false worship. So what I want to do is I want to give you some, some bullet points, starting at obviously unacceptable worship, working towards biblically acceptable worship. So here's the first one. Obvious unacceptable worship, worship anything that is not God. Would we agree with that? If you're worshiping anything that is not God, it is unacceptable to God. Here's the second one. 
And we see this in Romans chapter 1. Worship the creation instead of the creator. Worship the creation instead of the creator. Truly unacceptable, obviously unacceptable worship. How about this? Worship man-made idols. It's one thing to worship what God has created. It's wrong to worship what God has created. We need to worship God who creates. But how about if we create our own gods? Well, that's clearly unacceptable worship. Now it gets a little slippery. How about this? Still unacceptable. Worship idols, listen, alongside God. Now, for those of you who are waiting for me to name groups and churches that do that, I don't need to. You already know. So what does the Word of God say? Is anybody familiar with a little, little story about the golden calf? You know, a lot of people don't realize that when Moses went up on the mountain and they hadn't seen him for a while and they were kind of disappointed, and they go, you know, as for this fellow, they said, as for this fellow Moses, we don't even know what happened to him. So they came up with the golden calf. You know the story. They, they built the golden calf. They brought all their stuff. The calf was a, really a, a holdover from a false god, a false idol from Egypt. And they gathered around. But Aaron, the high priest, Moses' brother, who was supposed to be watching the, watching the camp while, while Big Brother was away, Big Brother spiritually, um, he, what he said to them, he goes, this is the God who led you out of Egypt. And he said, he led them to worship what he said was Jehovah while bowing down to a golden cow. That's worshiping God, allegedly, using idols. Now, those of you who are still waiting for me to name church, I don't need to. You know. You know. The churches around the world that are filled with statues and pictures, and people are just bowing down before them, praying to them. I said I wasn't going to mention it. <laughs> Clearly, worshiping idols alongside God or as, a, as allegedly a part of worshiping God, is totally unacceptable. How about this one? Worshiping, worship God according to our tastes and innovations. Now, this is another very interesting concept, which is rife in much of the church today, but it's, it's not original. In Leviticus chapter 10, we read a very, very interesting story about what God thinks about this. A couple of brothers, Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu. They were worshiping God. They were serving as priests in, in the, the house of the Lord. This is very early on after the Exodus. And they were supposed to worship God the way God said to do it. And God, in the previous chapter, had, had provided fire from heaven, which was the fire to be used in temple worship or tabernacle worship at that time. They were still in the tent. Nadab and Abihu, they were young, stupid, and restless. So they said, we can improve on that. So they did. We don't know exactly what they did, but they used what the Bible says was strange fire. They worshiped God. They used fire. God used fire. But you know what? We've got these really cool long-stemmed bicks. I don't know if they used that. But they had something that was other than what God said, and they worshiped God. Now, you tell me, you know, most of you know, what did God do to those two boys? He killed them on the spot. Let's see, how does God feel about us tweaking the worship of the Almighty, the Holy One? No. He killed them on the spot. And just to show how serious he was about it, he told their father, Aaron, and you're not allowed to weep. You cannot mourn their deaths because they deserved it that much. You know, apart from anything else, truly the God we serve, the God we worship is holy. He's not the big guy upstairs. He's not the dodger in the sky, to quote Tommy Lasorda. None of you are old enough. <laughs> He's God. And he's not to be trifled with. He killed those boys. Well, there is acceptable worship. You notice there's not six of these. There's just one. Acceptable worship is worship God according to his word. Worship God according to his word. 
It's not up to us to try to think of new ways to worship God. It's up to us to get our faces in the Word of God, praying that the Holy Spirit would give us illumination into the inspired, infallible Word of God to say, how are we to worship? Now, we know we do not worship using the Old Testament sacrificial system because Christ finished that. All of those sacrifices pointed to him, and then when he was offered, he, he was and is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. The, all of the Old Testament sacrifices had to be repeated over and over and over and over again. Jesus comes, he does it once, according to Hebrews, never to be repeated because it's complete and it's total and it's absolute. So, we know we don't do that, but we can certainly glean a lot of principles, even from Old Testament temple worship, about how we are to approach God. Not to mention things in the New Testament that give us more information. The way that God is to be worshipped is according to his word. In the centuries leading up to the Reformation, worship in the church had become more and more ornately complex while becoming less and less biblical. The Reformation was not just about soteriology, that's the, the doctrines of salvation, or we say the doctrines of grace. The Reformation was also about ecclesiology. There's a fancy word. Most of you know what it means, right? It means the doctrines of the church. How is the church to be uh, governed? How is it to operate, etc.? But it also was about doxology, which means worship and praise. The Reformation was uncovering some things. And by the way, the Reformation was not about coming up with anything new. It was about calling the church back to the scriptures, what was historically documented in the Bible all 66 books. One of the keys regarding the reformation of worship at that time was biblical simplicity. It's, it's really like this simple. Question number one, what does God's word say to do? Do that. Now listen carefully what I'm going to say because you might not hear it correctly the first time. What does God's word not say to do? And I would say don't do that. Notice I said what does God's word not say to do. I didn't say what does God's word say not to do. It's more than that. It's more than that because you say, well, God's word doesn't mention anything about half the stuff that goes on, not doesn't mention it. But if God's word doesn't say to do it, then maybe that's not what we should be doing, because once again, we go back to Nadab and Abihu. Simplicity doesn't mean flaky. That's a technical term. Simplicity doesn't mean a lack of excellence. No, God is God, and he deserves our very best. If you read the Old Testament, you'll see uh, places where the people who are leading worship are there to do it with skill. They're to do it with excellence, but they're to do what God says. God deserves our very best. That means stick with what God's word says. Don't add to it. And for heaven's sake, don't take away from it either. I'll tell you just an example of how as a young man, I took away from it. I was so worried about how are the people going to experience worship. And it's up to me as a pastor, you know, in your 20s when you know everything. I'm not putting anybody who's down who's 20. I was in my 20s once too. It was a crazy thing that God in his, in his humor called me to be a pastor when I didn't know what I was doing. But I was afraid to read long passages of Scripture because, oh, the people won't be able to follow. And yet the New Testament says to read publicly the Word of God. He told Timothy, read the Word of God. Give attention to reading. And it's talking about public reading. That's why we're not afraid to read. When we're not having communion, we're reading portions of Scripture in the worship service. Simplicity means don't add to it, don't take away from it. What does it mean, if you're looking at your notes, what does it mean to worship according to his word? Let me give you four components. Four components of biblical worship. And this is where I say if these components are there, there can be variations, but don't start with deviations. The first one is praying. Biblical worship is about prayer. Jesus said, my house shall be a house of prayer. We gather to pray. And when someone is up front praying, that's not when we sit and listen to someone else pray. That means we pray along with them silently while they pray aloud. 
It's okay when they say something that you're agreeing with is to say, yes, Lord, amen, to pray along with them. And it also means you can participate in prayer meetings. I had this novel idea of challenging the congregation. I still can't make up my mind whether I'm going to do it. Wink, wink. You know, at 9, th- we should tell people that worship service starts at 9.30 when we pray for a half an hour. I'm blessed by those who come, but I pray that many others of you would realize how important it is for the church to be praying, not just listening to preaching, praying together. Come to the prayer meetings. I said, I'm not even going to mention it, but I did. Praying. How about praising? That's number two, praising. That's worship, mostly in song, is the way our praises usually go. We'll talk more about that in just a moment. And thirdly, preaching. By the way, I know in this church you all know this. Preaching is every bit of, as much a part of the worship. It, it used to drive me nuts when I'd hear people say, well, you know, there's the worship portion of the service, and then there's the preaching. So it's worship. It's all worship. If you're not worshiping God by hearing his word, what are you doing? Huh? Worship in song and worship in preaching. What's the point of preaching? One of my favorite verses on the subject, 1 Corinthians 14, 3, says there's three components to good biblical preaching. The first is edification. That means to build up, means to educate. It means to equip the saints. It includes, secondly, exhortation which is to strongly urge and even implore people to action. Don't just hear it. What are we going to do about it? So that the Lord doesn't have to say to us, you, you call me, uh, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do the things that I say? The preaching is not just to say, here's what we're supposed to be doing, but it really doesn't matter. So here's what we're supposed to do. And let's do this. And third, it's to comfort. You don't need a definition of comfort. You know what comfort is. I'll just say this about comfort. Preaching, biblical preaching should comfort the afflicted, but it should also afflict the comfortable. And I said there's four of these components, praying, praising, preaching, and the fourth is partaking of the sacraments, baptism, and the Lord's Supper. We gave two messages last August about the the sacraments, so I won't go back over that. A bit more about singing. I said I'd say a little bit more about worship in song. Worship of anything but God. Or worshiping God not according to his word robs God of his glory. Why? Because our ideas and our innovations begin to replace God as the focal point. I remember being told as a young preacher, I've told you this before, but it wasn't just about worship, but it's true about worship. He'd, he'd say, young men, don't, don't try to come up with something new. Want to know why? He said, because if you can come up with something, you'll be able to. If you try to, you'll come up with something new. And then the people will want that, and then they'll say, well, now we want something new more. And you become a slave to just trying to keep up with keeping people. Just do what God says. Just do what God says. Whenever we come up with something new, we create an unbiblical expectation for the next newer thing, the next improved and innovative the next exciting thing, which eventually crowds God out. God is replaced in the people's minds with a desire for something new and exciting rather than what? Than God himself. When we come to worship the Lord, it is about him. It is about him. When that happens, when God gets crowded out, Because of all the new and the exciting, worship of God becomes the worship of worship, which is idolatry, because worship is not God, and if it is God, it's another God. God not only prefers, but he demands to be worshiped simply, regularly, and reverently, even when even when there's passion, even when there's pathos, even when there's excitement, it's still reverently. We are, we are invited to come boldly into the throne room of grace, but let's not forget whose throne room it is. It is the throne room of the Holy One. We dare not, ca- I just, you know, again, I, you know, the churches that advertise, we're casual and we're relevant. Don't go there. 
If God doesn't deserve the best, he's not God. And there's nothing more relevant than God as he reveals himself in the scriptures. People say, I'm bored with church. Yeah, that's because you're not encountering God there. Because God is not boring. God is almighty. We need to be remembering these things. We must not glorify worship instead of God. We must not glorify the music. We must not glorify the worship leaders. And we must not glorify ourselves as though worship is about how well we feel we've been entertained. You know, if you ever find yourself saying, I really like the worship today, why? Because it exalted Christ or because it had a good beat and you can bug out to it? To quote the Flintstones. <laughs> who were making fun of American Bandstand. The people who are laughing are old. <laughs> See, that's why you got to go to a church where it's young and new and innovating so you don't have to listen to old illustrations. But at any rate... The goal is not our entertainment. The goal is his glory. True biblical worship makes much of him and causes us to shrink in his presence as we remember that there is a God and we are not him. Worship is for God's, God's glory and God's glory alone. You hear me quote this whenever we talk about worship. Isaiah 42, 8, God speaking through his servant Isaiah he says, my glory to another, I will not give. He doesn't share that. He allows us to share in it as we glorify him. But once anything else but God becomes what is being glorified, it's unacceptable worship. We can actually judge any and every form of worship. We just need to ask ourselves, is this about God or is it about the worshiper? Is it about us? Is this about God or is it about the worship leader? Is it about the guy up there? I, 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 I've been to these places, so I'm not making this up. You know, you got the guy up there, the lights are all dim, you got the mood lining, says some sort of a lounge something. And the guy, you know, I used to have long hair, so don't get offended. You guys, my hair was longer than yours. Listen. The guy is up there playing the guitar, and there's a fan on the ground blowing so his hair could be doing it. What is this, a photo shoot for some supermodel? It's not about the worship leader. It's about God. Maybe he was just too warm. Is, it, is worship a performance to impress or to delight us? Or, it is a, or is it about bowing before and exalting him and him alone? This has got to be our goal. And, you know, don't, don't think I'm just saying, oh, well, this doesn't apply to us. Every one of us individually need to come to church and say, I'm coming to worship the Holy One. I'm coming to worship God. Not to get my weekly Sunday fix. It's not about us. It's about him. Is it according to our ideas? Is this worship according to our innovations? Is it according to our desires? Or is it according to Scripture? True worship comes from people who are wowed by God. A more biblical term for that would be awed by God. But nowadays, it's for a lot of people still, everything's awesome. Oh, that's awesome. Well, not really. It's, it's soup. You know, oh, this soup is awesome. Did you fall on your face trembling for fear when you took your first sip? Then it wasn't awesome. <laughs> God is awesome. And when we come into his presence, we want to be wowed by him, not by people. We don't want to be wowed by theatrical lighting, by thumping rhythms or, rhythms or unusually loud Music. Why don't we want the music to be so loud in this church? I tell you over and over again, because God wants to hear the people sing. I, I love Spurgeon on this. He, he, they didn't have a band at his church, I'm pretty sure. But that's a joke. Uh, 1800s, there was no bands in the church. 
but they had instruments. But Spurgeon, you know, this was something he wrestled with because he said, and I love this quote, he goes, music isn't necessary. Instrumental music is not necessary. God wants to hear the people's voices. So we want to keep the volume down low enough so that we can hear something besides the people up front because it's not about a performance. It's about us singing to God. To protect His glory in our worship, God has ordained ordinary means, ordinary methods, prayer, praise, preaching, and partaking of the sacraments. For what purpose? To glorify His name and to sanctify His people. These God-ordained ordinary means of grace have sustained the church for 2,000 years. Surely they are dependable today. And surely they will be tomorrow. Biblical worship in song is not for our entertainment. It isn't us coming to hear a performance. It's about God's people singing for His glory, which will be a means through which He is pleased to sanctify His people. God loves to hear you sing. You see, I don't sing well. I know I've sat next to you. But God loves to hear his people sing. Why has this book of Psalms got 150 songs in it? He loves to hear his people sing. As a footnote, I just want to say a brief thing about the content, not just about the accoutrements, the music, the mood, et cetera, et cetera, but what about the content of our, our musical worship? While musical ability is important, as I already mentioned, in Psalm 33, 3, and in 1 Chronicles 15, 22, there are specific words about the fact that the people leading the worship need to do so with skill. You say, I want to be one of the singers who leads the congregation. Can we hear you sing? Maybe you should be a part of the people in the choir who are singing because you don't have skill in that. You know, most people wouldn't say, I want to play the piano if they don't know how to play the piano. So we need to have some skill involved in for the leaders so that we're all singing something close to the same melody. <laughs> it just helps. It just helps. Musical ability is important because God deserves the best, but musical ability doesn't qualify a person to write music and lyric for worship songs in the church. Only those who know something of the Psalms should be writing worship music. Why? Because the Psalms is the worship book in the, in the Bible. The Psalms are the only worship music that are actually inspired by God. God breathed. Now, that's not, obviously, it's we're not a psalms-only church. I don't have anything against people who do want to sing psalms only. We don't sing psalms only. But the psalms must inform us as to what the content of worship music should be. And in the Old Testament, it wasn't, you know, some guy with a lute or a harp who said, hey, I got a new song. It was the priests. Only the priests, only the Levites were to lead in the music. I mean, to actually lead it. Obviously, we have songs by Solomon and even Moses and by many by David. So let's worship. Let's worship God. Are you ready for this? Let's worship God the way Cal played baseball instead of how Barry played baseball ordinarily. No artificial enhancements because God wants to hear the people sing. He wants to hear us sing his praises week in and week out every time we gather, which I, you notice I didn't just say every Sunday because we have a midweek worship service too. Some of you may not be aware of that. And let us worship God according to the ordinary means of grace. In other words, what his word says, trusting that this is how to worship God God's way. Now you think I'm done but I purposely switched this to not end with Barry and Cal, but to end with this. Why do we worship God? This will go fast, so listen quickly. Because we were created to worship God. Because we are commanded to worship God. It's more than an invitation. It's more than a suggestion. It's a command. How about this? We are to worship God because God is God. That means he's our creator. That means he's our sovereign ruler. 
That means he's our righteous judge. And praise God for we who have our faith in his son, Jesus Christ. He is our savior. Jesus Christ lived a sinless life that we could never live. He died a death he didn't deserve, and he did it for us. He is our Savior. And then he rose from the dead to prove he is who he said he is. He saved us from bondage to sin, and he saved us from the eternal wrath of his Father. Because God is God, he, Jesus is our Lord. That means our master and our commander. We worship God because God is true, because God is good, because God is beautiful. Worship the Lord and the beauty of His holiness, the Bible says. We worship God because God is extraordinarily worthy to be worshiped. So, it's too bad this isn't a home fellowship Sunday because you'd have something to roast the pastor over, over lunch. But I pray that you take seriously what worship is. And let's continue to worship the Lord with another song, shall we? Father in heaven, we ask for your your grace on your church all over, but particularly for us, Lord. We don't want to think we're doing everything perfectly because we're not. But Lord, may may we remain committed to worshiping you according to your word, and may we be right and steer us where we're not about worship. As you have over the last 35 plus years, our worship has matured, and we thank you for it, Lord. We want it to be about you and not about us. Mm -hmm.